Welcome back to the 12 Days of Chris Bonmas, and today we have a movie-based game to look at, which means there's an extremely high probability that I'll be ranting in about two minutes. The game in question is Aragon, based on the 2006 movie, based on the fantasy novel of the same name. Does it rise above the curse that plagues most of these types of games? Unfortunately, it doesn't, and it's a real shame when you consider the subject matter of the film, and you factor in the previous games that the developer worked on. Aragon was a book released in 2002, written by Christopher Pellini. Pellini wrote the book when he was 14, and it was self-published by his parents who owned a publication company. So talk about a lucky break there. Now I actually read this book when I was in middle school, and I honestly can't remember much of it. I thought it was just average, and I never asked for the follow-up, so I guess it really didn't stick with me. Even when I was that age, I could tell that Pellini wrote this book a certain way. He used a bunch of aspects from novels and movies he liked watching as a kid, and unfortunately, or fortunately I guess depending on your opinions, these influences have bled all over Aragon. People will come out and say that Aragon is nothing more than a Lord of the Rings ripoff because of its fantasy setting, but actually the series, or at least the first two novels, are complete ripoffs of Star Wars Episodes 4 and 5. The books mostly revolve around Aragon and his dragon Saphira. Also, you get it? Aragon? It's a, you get rid of the, the E and you put a D and it's a dragon. Yay! It's so clever. Anyway, Aragon lives out in the middle of Noah with his uncle, and one day he finds a stone that turns out to be a dragon egg. He's later hunted by the evil empire that rules the land, and whose ruler, King Galbatorix, apparently murdered all of the other dragon riders years earlier. Uh, the dragon riders were keepers of peace in the land before all that all went down, by the way. Aragon now teams up with an old hermit named Brom, who turns out to have once been a dragon rider years before. The two then try to reach a rebellion group called the Varden, only to be sidetracked when an elf named Arya is kidnapped by the empire, and Aragon goes to save her, only for Brom to meet his untimely end, and seriously, I'm gonna stop it here, because I think you can fill in what happens next. Trust me. If you've seen Star Wars, it's not that hard. So while the book was mildly successful, 20th Century Fox decided to buy the rights and make a film. And since the Harry Potter series at the time was raking in millions at the box office, I guess they thought it was a good idea. And yeah, Aragon was released right in the middle of the Potter franchise's lifespan to try and compete. Yeah, great idea there. I don't know why they wanted to make this movie since clearly it was going to get slammed for being too similar to other properties, yet in an ironic twist, the movie somehow removed what little originality was in Pellini's novel and instead left in all the Star Wars plot elements. Naturally, the film was crushed to death by critics who called it out for being a shameless ripoff, but the fans of the novels even turned on it, saying that the filmmakers removed all the important scenes right out of the book. But where does the video game fit into all this? Well, much like how Aragon's film and book are copies of better fantasy and adventure stories, the game is sort of a copy of a much better movie-based fantasy adventure game. You see, the video game was created by Stormfront Studios, and at first that name might not be ringing any bells, because you probably never really heard of them, but only a few hours in and it was clear what they had made before. In an ironic twist, Stormfront had actually made the Lord of the Rings The Two Towers game four years earlier, and that influence can be found all over the place in this game. However, it feels like Stormfront either forgot what they had done previously or wanted to do different things, since Aragon questionably has removed a ton of features that were implemented in the Two Towers game. The story follows the plot of the film, though I hope you're familiar with the film, since this game is a retelling of that rather than an outright sequential narrative. Instead, the game is narrated by Damon Hansu's character, who's like a side character that you meet at the end of the movie, and he's essentially recounting the events of the film, since I guess he's bored and has nothing to do, and he probably knows that the sequel's never going to happen, so he might as well do this to get a paycheck. There's no in-level cutscenes where characters talk and exchange dialogue and the plot moves forward. It's not even happening when you finish a level. Nope, Damon Hansu just explains what's happening between levels over very, very terrible looking cinematics. The plot doesn't really add anything or expand on what was in the film, nor does it include the aspects that the book had that were left out of the film, which makes me kind of think that the writer of the game probably had never read the book. The game is a beat-em-up where you fight enemies as Aragon while traveling along a linear path, again very similar to how the Two Towers game played out. You fight your way through 16 levels, selecting each one on a map screen that looks very similar to the map selection screen from the Two Towers game. Now, despite the game's developers clearly ripping off their own work, they somehow managed to make it worse. The combat has you using the X and O buttons to perform combos, though mashing X works on all enemies for most encounters. Switching up the buttons allow you to perform grapple moves on enemies and then attack them up close and personal. Though these animations here look like Aragon is going to go full on Mortal Kombat, but then he just sort of knocks them out. Enemies do have shields, but unlike in the Two Towers game, you don't have to combo them a certain way to break the shields, just button mash and eventually they drop them. You also get access to a bow, but it's not as fun as the bow stuff was to use in the Two Towers. In the Two Towers, you can quickly fire off arrows to damage enemies or hold it longer for one-hit kills. You can kind of do the same here, but Aragon's standard arrow shots, the ones that aren't built up in power, seem to do almost nothing to enemies, and because of this I really didn't rely on arrows that much. 
Eventually you get magic, which is supposed to change up the combat, but it kinda doesn't. The first spell you get allows you to enchant spears from a bucket, and it automatically homes in on enemies. Also, there's an unlimited number of spears in these buckets, so you can just stand in one spot and go to town spearing all the enemies to death. Also, in a strange turn, these buckets don't appear in later levels, or at least I didn't seem to see any. I mean, I guess they're expecting you to use the other magic spells that you got later in the game, but it's kind of weird that one aspect of the gameplay from earlier was completely dropped. The second spell has you using the force to push enemies to remove their shields or to knock them off ledges. Despite the game being on a linear path that you can't fall off, you can use this spell to knock enemies off that path, and in most cases you can abuse the hell out of this design. For instance, in this level, I'm standing in like, what, knee-high water? But since I'm force pushing enemies to me, they die since they're hitting the water's hitbox. And you can do the same thing in other levels when you're on bridges or cliffs. It's actually a helpful strategy since sword combat is boring as hell as I'll explain in a bit. The next spell is a shield that explodes outwards and knocks enemies down, though most times they get back up pretty fast. So I only really used this spell when a ton of enemies overwhelmed me in a tight spot. And the enemies can really overwhelm you. There are times when they're relentless and they keep knocking you down, which can lead to quick deaths on the higher difficulty. And finally, the last spell is a fire ability called Brazinga, which sounds a lot more like... Bazinga. Seriously, I cannot take that spell name seriously anymore. Anyway, this spell burns up enemies. This one's kind of useful as well, since when enemies are on fire, they might run off a cliff and die, which, again, helps you not having to fight them. Also, when using Bazinga, you fire an arrow that explodes on impact, and this can help you clear up enemies fast. The problem here is that you have to hold the arrow for a bit to actually do any real damage. Another issue rearing its ugly head far too often is that the shoulder buttons used for the arrows and magic abilities is also the button to evade, so most time you'll try to launch a quick arrow or try to throw a guy real fast, only to see Aragon dodge rolling across the level. Combat overall is boring and very repetitive since that's all you do in each level for the most part. There's a ton of button mashing if you strictly use the combos, which is why you're going to want to use the magic to make battles go by faster by cheating the design and having enemies run to their death rather than outright attacking them. The combat system is also boring since it never changes. You never learn new moves or combos and your standard moves never seem to get stronger. Occasionally between levels the game will say something like Aragon has picked up a new sword and your attacks are stronger now, but you never really feel the effect since the enemies still take a ton of hits to bring down. The funny thing is that in the Two Towers game, you could buy combos. There wasn't a ton of them, but they were there, and it, there was always some new move to try out, and it was fun to experiment and see which moves could help you out. I mostly found myself using magic to send enemies to their deaths over and over again, and never use my sword. Also, at one point, I was so damn tired of combat that I just realized that you can skip past the enemies, since you don't gain experience points, which again was something you could do in the Two Towers game, and that helped you buy those upgrades. So in later levels, I just sprinted for the end, avoiding literally everything in sight. At certain parts, the game does lock you in a section where you have to fight to move on, but 80% of the time, you can just run ahead, reach the end of the level, in just a few minutes, engage in the final last mandatory fight, and then that's it, the level's done. Though the second to last level seems to be aware that you might have been doing this, so it gives you a mission objective to kill 400 enemies, and holy hell this mission can go suck a railroad spike. You thankfully keep moving around the level to kill enemies, but only a handful show up at a time, and I got excited when Sephira showed up and started burning the fields with the minute, because that brought the number up a lot faster. However, even with several spots where Sephira did burn guys alive, the end result screen showed that I killed over 300 of the enemies which I couldn't believe it happened. There's also a special move meter, which both characters can fill up, but in 90% of cases, it's up to you to do this on your own. The thing that sucks about this bar is that both characters can find orbs to power it up, but for whatever reason, the AI just doesn't feel like doing it. In a few fleeting instances, the bar will connect halfway and allow you to perform the move, but when you're on your own, the bar has to fill up across the whole screen. It doesn't take long, mind you, though even when you fill up the bar, it's basically a simple invincible mode, which doesn't really change the combat. The other facet to the gameplay is the slight platforming. Aragon can jump and grab certain ledges that the game feels like letting you grab. Though thanks to the fixed camera, in rare circumstances, you might not see the thing that you need to hang from. Thank god Braum was in every level, because he seemed way more excited than me to reach the end of the game, and so he would more often than not jump onto the object that would clue me into what I had to jump onto. I like the idea of platforming around, since it's surprisingly not a feature that came from the two towers, but here's just a small aspect traversing the levels. I get that this is a beat-em-up, but a few platforming sections at least would have given me something, anything else to do. Now at this point you're probably saying, wait a minute Chris, isn't, isn't there a dragon in this game? I mean, come on, the main character's name is, come on, we went through this dragon! Well, there is, but apparently Stormfront must have forgot about it because out of the 16 levels, only two of them have you flying on Sephira. It's like the development cycle was coming to a close and somebody was just like, we, we touched up the, the boring combat and we added a few tweaks to the, the magic system and holy shit, we forgot about the dragon, shit! The two levels with Sephira are nothing to get excited about though. Boat levels are on rails and you circle around the level on a loop shooting at all the enemies and they last for about five minutes apiece. 
While on Sephira, you can crash into enemies or fire spells, and in the second level, you can burn the enemies with fire, finally. Now, I know in the book and the film, Sephira can't breathe fire until the end, but seriously, the developers just couldn't say screw it and have Sephira breathing fire for the whole game just to get a few more levels out of her. Also, aside from these solo flying levels, you can summon Sephira within the regular levels to attack enemies. However, you can only summon her in about five of the other levels, and only when the game gives you the okay to. You see, you have to wait for a blue symbol to appear, and then Sephira will swoop down, kill some enemies, and then she flies off. Seriously, these icons show up so infrequently that I almost forgot that this was even an option. I was extremely disappointed by the lack of dragon gameplay, since you would think that that would have been the focus given the subject matter of the film. It's about a goddamn dragon, how do you not do that? How about some open levels where you control Sephira rather than the on rail sections? Was that too hard for them? And you might think that the dragon sections would at least take away from the monotony of the repetitive combat, but no, these sections are even worse. The first has you circling around firing arrows at anything that moves, and there's nothing you can do to speed this up or even affect this. You're just along for the ride, and it can drag on for what seems like forever. The second area seems to have an interesting mechanic to play with, but it doesn't seem to know how to use it properly. So in this area, there's a bunch of towers, and the goal is to protect them by burning the enemies or destroying their machines. You get a mini-map here, and you can even see where the towers are, making you think that this would be some sort of an open area to fly around in. But no, you're still on the rails. Instead of figuring out which tower needs your help, you just fly around in circles and burn and crash into whatever you can. At the end, a bunch of the towers are destroyed, which I'm convinced you can't stop, because I burned up every enemy I could, crashed into every catapult, and flew in every which direction I could at any given time, but everything just respawns over and over again, making any progress I made feel completely meaningless. Presentation is frankly all over the map. I already mentioned the weird cutscenes that bookend each level, but I really didn't explain how they look. So the design team here has gone for a 1940s film reel effect, with every filter and digital effect from a 9 Inch Nails video. The characters tend to look rendered like the in-game models here, but everything else around them looks different in almost every scene. I mean, sometimes it looks illustrated like an old book, which I guess fits, but then there are flashes and weird edits and overlays and that film grain effect, and seriously, I feel like the game needs a warning for potential seizures. The game models look okay, or at least their faces do. However, the textures on their clothes are pretty blurry, which might be why the camera seems to always be 60 feet away during gameplay. And speaking of lazy clothes, I ended up noticing this glaring issue near the end of the game. So near the last level, Aragon gets the suit of armor from the Varden to wear during the final battle. And despite me wearing it all level, in the cutscene that ends that level, he's back in his original farm boy outfit. But then in the rendered cutscene, he's back in the armor. And then when the game returns to normal, he's back in the first outfit. I mean, how did no one notice this? I, I, I get that this isn't like a, a playtesting kind of an issue, but you're telling me that when someone hopefully checked on all the cutscenes, no one saw this? Because this kind of mistake is pretty embarrassing. Level design is on par with the gameplay in that it's repetitive. You get multiple village levels at the start that have the same wooden bridges, and I could show you these areas out of order and you wouldn't know which level it belonged to. Then there's Durza's Fortress. It's like 20 circular floors of dark gray rocks. You go around and around and up and up and it all looks the same. I mean, sometimes a rock is in a different place, but with the repetitive level design in combat, this level made me want to rage quit. The music is decent in that it kicks up during the fights, but it's largely absent when you're just walking around. Though, considering more than half the game is combat, you're pretty much always going to have the music going. Overall, Aragon is yet another dime a dozen movie-based tie-in. When I found out that Stormfront was buying this one, I was kind of hopeful since I liked the Two Towers game. Though a quick comparison of the two titles shows that they didn't quite learn from what they did the first go-around. The Two Towers game was loads more fun than this. I mean, it was the same hack and slash style of gameplay that Aragon is, but there were upgrades and certain enemies had to be fought with certain moves, there was an easy parry system to deflect arrows, and the levels were short so it never dragged. But with Aragon, it's like the polar opposite. The combat's boring because you never learn new moves, and while the magic element is okay, it doesn't drastically change anything, and honestly, you're just gonna abuse the force pull move to kill everything instantly to avoid fighting. And Aragon has too many levels where it's not based on anything from the film, but rather areas from the film where you just fight the same enemies over and over again. And the lack of any interesting level design involving Sephira just left a bad taste in my mouth. Again, Dragon! Literally, on the cover of the book and the movie! Like, really? Two levels? Two level? I was getting bored at about the halfway mark, and I don't think I would have mustered up the strength to finish this game if I wasn't reviewing it. It's not the worst movie-based game ever, but it's just so damn boring. If you really like the Aragon movie, and I'm probably talking to a small majority now, I guess you could check this out. Otherwise, j just skip it. Skip the movie while you're at it, that wasn't that much better. Read the book! I mean, the book must have been a little better. Or, read any book. Read a book. How about that? Just read a book. So the 12 Days of Chris Bonmas will continue. Thanks for watching.